who is currently in Israel. A warm welcome, as always, to Colonel Richard Kemp. Hello, Richard. Hi, Johnny. It's good to be with you. It's always good to speak to you, sir. Now, can you describe to me the successes in recent days of the Israeli military within uh, Gaza? Because all of the discussion has been surrounding the Al-Shifa hospital. But let's, let's broaden it out slightly. Yeah, well, um, the IDF have been operating inside Gaza for a few weeks now uh, on the ground. And in that time, they've acted very rapidly, albeit not with lightning speed, because, of course, they have to do, as well as try and kill as many terrorists as possible, they have to do two other things, one of which is to minimise the loss of civilian, to minimise the number of civilian casualties, and secondly, to reduce the loss of their own soldiers, not just as an IDF soldier's life, worth no less than anybody else's. But of course, you need to keep as many of them alive as possible as you can to be a combat effective. So so they don't just go in at breakneck speed. They do it in as carefully and considerably as they can. But in that time, they have killed a very large number of Hamas terrorists, several thousand. Actually, that, that does include terrorists killed in the air campaign beforehand. But several thousand Hamas terrorists have been killed by the idea from the air on the ground. They managed to locate and destroy a large number of tunnels. They've seized uh, vast numbers of Hamas weaponry and other military equipment, including Kalashnikov rifles, rocket launchers, and many other different weapons. Um, and they've, they've effectively they've sealed off Gaza City so that it's hard for terrorists to escape from there, although some have and some probably still can, but it makes it harder. They've also ushered out as many of the civilian population from Gaza as they can. So it gives them much more of a clean run against the terrorists inside Gaza City. And there's one other terrible prospect to think about here, Richard, not only the human shields of Gazan citizens, which Hamas have always hidden behind, but also the 240 hostages that are being kept all and sundry. And some have been rescued, a very few, and some tragically have already been killed. And this makes the IDF's uh, war in such an urban situation even harder. Yeah, I'd say that the hostages, I mean, the, all of the challenges of fighting in an urban environment against an enemy that has spent a long time preparing to defend that territory is very, very challenging. But I would say that the IDF's greatest challenge is to rescue as many of the hostages as possible that remain still alive. We obviously don't know how many that is, and we don't know where they are. I think there's a pretty good chance that some or all of them will have been moved out of Gaza City and are probably somewhere further south. But that's pure speculation on my part. But actually getting to the finding out where they are, pinpointing their locations, identifying the defences around them, and then carrying out surprise operations to rescue them before the terrorists can kill them is enormously challenging. I, I myself was involved in a several hostage rescue operations of British citizens kidnapped in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And that was just in sort of twos and threes or, or, the, or individual hostages. And that itself was massively challenging for British and American forces. So the, 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 the difficulty of locating and rescuing this large number is, uh, I think, off the scale. Richard, that is a fascinating insight. And how successful were you? And how many of these campaigns did you fight in order to rescue British hostages? Well, I was involved in a number of different uh, rescue operations. And I have to say that most of them were not successful. Um, and, and unfortunately, the odds tend to be stacked against, uh, against the rescue operation of hostages because the enemy obviously know that you will be trying to find them. They obviously position them in a place that is best defended, a secure location. And they'll probably rig it up with explosives. They'll probably have a gun to the hostages' heads. So actually, the key, the really key points are, first of all, pinpoint intelligence, which is very hard to come by, uh, uh, particularly given that they may well be moving the hostages around frequently to avoid them being located. And secondly, as I mentioned before, launching that surprise operation, because if you give forewarning in any way to the terrorists, if they get wind that you're about to come and carry out a rescue, it's relatively easy for them to kill the hostages before you get to them. 
Now, there is one little bit of intelligence that I might add to this, and I'm just a layman and I'm just watching here from the UK, but I saw the terrible prospect of uh, a humanitarian column of Gazans being shepherded from the north to the south, but the IDF watching behind a turret, megaphoning the Arab population in Hebrew, just in case among the throng of Palestinian people moving south, there might be an Israeli hostage being shepherded along. There was no Hebrew speaker, there was no Israeli among them as far as that shot was concerned, which implies, Richard, that these people might be underground more likely than, than above ground, given the metro system, as so many people call the tunnel system in Gaza. I would say the greatest likelihood is that they're going to be kept inside tunnels and, as I said before, probably moved out of Gaza City and are somewhere further south in, in, in a tunnel system or another secure location. Um, and the, I think, as far as Hamas is concerned, keeping those hostages is one of the greatest weapons they have against Israel because they, they, they're, they're, they're a phenomenal bargaining chip. And actually, that applies really whether the hostages are alive or dead. And I would estimate, I'm sorry to say, but I would estimate that at least some of the hostages that were taken are no longer alive. I, I think it's unlikely that everyone has survived so far, um, either been deliberately killed or has died accidentally. Um, so I think, but, but even whether they're alive or dead, particularly as Hamath are not willing to provide proof of life on the hostages, it means that they are all, whether they're dead bodies or live hostages, they're all very, very important bargaining chips for Hamas, and we're seeing how they're using them now. They're using them to try and and encourage Israel to agree to some form of ceasefire in exchange for hostage release. And obviously, that ceasefire is very much in Hamas's interest. They're under enormous pressure. The Israeli operation so far has been extremely successful, has placed Hamas very much on the back foot and facing defeat, which I think is inevitable, whether it's sooner or later. And, and, the, and the best hope they've got of of somehow regrouping, moving out, moving away, reorganising themselves is to have a ceasefire based on an agreement to release some of the hostages. So geographically now the war has started in the north and is pushing through to the south, but how far south will this go? I mean, is it a battle against time before Hamas is destroyed uh, totally between how far Israel pushes into Gaza? Can Israel defeat Hamas before it gets to the Rafah border, for example? I don't think so. I think they're going to have to push right the way south uh, in order to, because you know, as, as the idea for attacking, Hamas terrorists inevitably are running away um, with, with the hope of either escaping or winning to, or living to fight another day. And so they will, many of them will already have moved south, probably including uh, some of the top leaders. And I think Israel's going to have to push right on through the Gaza Strip, right to the south. And obviously that in itself brings massive complications because most of the civilian population has moved south. So they're going to have to, I think they've already been dropping leaflets on Han Yunus uh, and other places telling people to move to a specific designated location in the southwest of the Gaza Strip, which the, the IDF is saying is, is a safe location. Obviously, that you know, the, 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 there's every chance that Hamas terrorists will end up going there as well in some cases. But I think the most important thing is not necessarily to kill every single Hamas terrorist, because that is probably an impossibility, but to to wipe out the top level leadership or maybe the second tier leadership and do a huge damage to the organisation as a whole, so it can no longer function as a terrorist organisation. And after that, it's then a question of mopping up and tidying up and, you know, basically dismantling any, any of the remnants of that organisation that remain. Richard, the top-level leadership, as we know, live in seven-star hotels in Qatar, and uh, Qatar is playing a major role, we're told, in trying to secure as many hostages as possible. Um, Israel can't go into Qatar, can it, and try and eliminate Yahya Sinwar and his chums, can, can they? Well, Sinwar, I believe, is still in the Gaza Strip. And when I was talking about the top level, I don't know that, obviously, but I believe so. Um, but when I was talking about the top level leadership, I was really talking about the top level leadership inside Gaza. Right. But of course, the, the political leadership remains in places like uh, Qatar and some in 
Turkey and and there are, obviously there are some Hamas in um, in the West Bank as well, Judea and Samaria, and in Lebanon. But the key leadership is in Qatar, and Israel can't obviously cannot carry out an attack against that leadership in Qatar. But I would say that um, they are. I don't necessarily say it's going to happen today, tomorrow, but I would say those people are dead men walking. Somehow, justice is going to arrive at their doorstep at some stage. We've heard um, some very direct um, quotes from your Av Galant, the defence minister, who's become a bit of a hero in Israel for standing up to Benjamin Netanyahu over judicial reform. He was sacked and then reinstated the next day. Uh, he is of the opinion that every single combatant, whether they are a direct political leader or indeed someone who was taking photographs tipped off about what happened on the early morning hours of October the 7th, they are targets as well. And this brings up this idea that when the Hamas Gazan Health Ministry uh, quote their deaths, they only say it in form of Palestinians. They talk about them in all forms of citizenship rather than fighters as well. It is time the media stood up to this idea and took with a pinch of salt the quotes that come from the so-called Gazan Health Ministry. Yeah, I mean, we know from the past record of previous conflicts in Gaza that the, the Hamas Health Ministry, otherwise known as the Gaza Health Ministry, inflates the figures that they give of, um, of uh, civilians killed. And when they give a figure, what, whatever it is today, whether it's 11,000, 12,000, I don't know what it is, but um, whatever the figure is today, you can be certain that it is inflated significantly. And secondly, I think you can be certain that they... Well, you, we know for sure that that includes Hamas terrorists, other ter terrorists from other groups, as well as uninvolved civilians in that number. And from Israel's previous... Uh, and also, by the way, it includes probably quite a large number that have been killed by Hamas themselves, whether it's by rockets dropping, dropping short or by being deliberately killed by Hamas for some reason or another. But there will be a large number in there who, who have been killed by Hamas. Uh, and, and the other terrorist groups. Fine. And there's no differentiation between between those various different uh, different sections of, of individuals. That they are portrayed as civilian casualties. Historically, or from previous conflicts, um, what we've seen, and this is broad brush stuff, I'm afraid, it's quite hard to give more uh, precise figures, but approximately one civilian has been killed in Gaza for every terrorist killed, mm. which sounds bad. That sounds really bad when the IDF are actually targeting the terrorists. But it is not so... It, it, it is bad, but it's not so bad when you compare it, for example, to the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, where Western forces, British forces, American forces, the death rate there, generally speaking, in those two conflicts was between three and five civilians for every fighter killed. So the IDF, because they're so extremely careful and they've got such a well-developed system for protecting the lives of innocent civilians, have achieved in previous conflicts a much better, much better uh, ratio. It's, it's still bad, of course it's bad, but that's what war is like when you're trying to destroy an enemy that is using its own civilian population as human shields. Finally, Richard, as the war intensifies and as we acknowledge the uh, pace of Israeli success has surprised a lot of people, how do you think uh, the day after the war is fought will shape up for Gaza? Will there be an international force of peacekeeping within the north? Will there be a buffer zone, a little bit like the Golan, where Israel takes on um, its... I don't know, um, occupation, for want of a better word, or a, a temporary uh, seizure uh, of, of Gaza to create a buffer zone for the safety of its citizens in the south, like, for example, in Sterot, the border town uh, in Israel. How do you think Israel will be administered the day after the war is finished? Well, I, I think that the chances of an international force deploying into Gaza is, I would say, is quite low. Um, and and, and I, I would say it's probably also undesirable because we've seen how international forces operate in the past. And we're witnessing now how, how, how for example, UNIFIL in Lebanon, which is 
supposed to keep Hezbollah north of the Latani River. There's not supposed to be any military forces south of the Latani River. But we see that Hezbollah has 150,000 rockets pointing at Israel. So we can see how ineffective international forces are. I think the only option that I can see for the foreseeable future is once Hamas has been destroyed, for Israel to, to take full security responsibility for the Gaza Strip. And that means having IDF forces either permanently stationed inside Gaza or with the ability to move in and out as required to deal with threats that develop. Uh, and I, I, don't think there's, I don't think there's any way, no matter what you know, the United States may think, and they don't, I don't think like that idea, but I don't think there's any other way of doing it while uh, defending Israeli citizens from the threat of, of either a successor to Hamas or some evolution of Hamas. So I think that's going to happen. As far as the day-to-day -day management, shall we say, of the Gaza Strip, aside from security is concerned, I think that's still a, an unanswered question, how exactly that's going to work, whether it's some kind of United Nations administration, whether it's uh, some other, you know, some kind of um, leadership taken from within Gaza, whether it's the Palestinian Authority or, or something else it is, is an open question now, I believe. But, yeah. but in terms of security, I think we've got, we, you know, it's a simple fact that the IDF will have to maintain a presence in and around Gaza for the foreseeable future.